Hello and welcome to Adult Music, the podcast with music for the mature mind. Mike, it's been a musical day for me right from the get-go. Yeah, me too. But mine was all in front of the stereo, though. Yours was uh, elsewhere. I woke up and I did the customary new release check. And then I finished up my notes on the jazz program, especially the last release at the end of this episode. You better stay around and listen to this because it's a really good recording. You're going to want to hear that. And then all afternoon I spent in the concert hall listening to live classical music. Nice. That's something I guess I should have been doing, but uh, I had other things to do. <laughs> and it was all a Russian program. The Rachmaninoff Second Piano Concerto. Yeah. And then Tchaikovsky's Fifth Symphony. So I feel like I need some vodka now. <laughs> yeah. Do you have it? No, I, I don't think I have a bottle of vodka. Okay. You know, I went there because of a really wonderful young lady that I met this year named Maki. And she yeah. was in that performance and she listens to the podcast. So thanks for the wonderful music, Maki. Yeah. You always meet the best people through music. Yeah, I agree. Well, not always. <laughs> well, <laughs> you'll find out next week. Yeah, there's one exception. We were just talking about that. There's him, but there's other people that you meet, you know, and when you're going through the whole music thing that, uh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, other news this week, we've got our 150th episode badge from Podbean. This week is actually episode 144, but if you count these seven interviews, we're at 150. So thanks to all the listeners, musicians, and record labels for keeping us going. We're just getting started here. Yeah, thanks to Positone for giving us a like on that yeah, as well. thank you. I saw that too. And this is going to be our last regular episode with new music for the year. And so next week's episode is going to be the best of adult music, all the recordings we listen to. There's about 300 of them we listened to this year, I think. Boy. So we're going to go remember all of those and pick our favorites in each category. That's coming up next week. That'll be our yeah. Christmas gift for you. And we're going to continue to do it in the bizarro style as we have done. So Mike's going to pick his jazz picks. I'm going to pick the classical ones. And then we'll round out with whatever doesn't overlap. Well, basically, I picked the 10 jazz records that you convinced me <laughs> were the best <laughs> ones. And the, I guess the other way around, you know, because I kind of was handing you these classical records. And right. uh, so you just decide which ones you like the best. And then we'll kind of say what each of us like the best in our own category afterwards. It's fun that way. I like it. Yeah, that works out really well. Mm -hmm. And you'll have a nice list of recordings, many of which you won't find talked about anywhere else. I can guarantee that. Yeah, literally anywhere else. I wouldn't find out about these if I wasn't on this podcast or if I wasn't friends with Russ. That's right. <laughs> so this episode, as I said, is going to have the final six new recordings that we're going to discuss. And as always in the episode description, you can find links to Spotify and Apple Music for all the music that we're going to talk about. And in the top of the description, there's a link to the full episode playlist. That's all the music in one place on Deezer, CD quality streaming music from France. You can also listen to the podcast there as well if you want to get everything in one place. And wherever you listen to us, if you don't see the full description or the recording links are not easy to follow, anything not clear about it, just come over to our host site, Podbean, P-O-D-B-E-A-N.com, where everything is easy to follow. If you enjoy the podcast, please follow or subscribe wherever you listen to us. Tell a music-loving friend. That helps us grow our audience. And if you take a moment to give us a ranking or write a short review, that helps us get listed in the music category recommendations, another way we can grow our audience. Come over to follow us on our Facebook page as well. See our handsome faces and get new release information and other little tidbits throughout the week. I put up a bunch of new jazz things this week that may or may not make it into an episode. You can leave a message or comment there as well. And if you want to get in touch directly, any questions or comments, our email address is adultmusicpod podcast, all one word, at gmail.com. want to mention, as always, our friends over at the same difference, two jazz fans, one jazz standard podcast, that's AJ and Johnny, looking at those jazz standards, several versions of one standard in each episode, comes out twice a month, they play little snippets of the versions, discuss the history of the original, and say what they like and don't like about the different versions. There's a link to their podcast in the description. And if you stick around to the end of the episode, you can hear their little promo. And we did a guest episode recording with them a few weeks ago. And we found out that's going to come out January 1st over right. on their channel there. So looking forward to hearing that to start the new year out. Yeah, right along with our first episode, which is actually going to come out in America on December 31st. That's our first episode of 2024 is coming out in the U.S. in 2023. Wow. How about that? This is the earliest we could possibly do the year-end episode, actually, because it's just so, a yeah. weird year. Christmas Day and the New Year just happen to be on the day we usually post the podcast here in Japan, which right. is Monday, which is Sunday in the U.S. still. Time. <laughs> 
time. Yeah. Speaking of time, <laughs> we have kind of a time theme yeah, uh, we do. tonight, don't we? Yeah. And I tell you, I'm going to be spending some time playing some samples this week because there's a lot of stuff I just want everyone to hear, especially right. on the final jazz pick. So here's our fair use disclaimer. Music sample clips are for commentary and educational purposes. We recommend that listeners listen to the complete recordings, all of which are available on streaming services in the links provided. We also suggest that if you enjoy the music, you consider purchasing the CDs or high-quality downloads to support the artists. All right, what time warp are we going to jump into to begin things tonight, Mike? Well, I don't know that this is a time warp, but it's um, something that our friend Daniel Bernardson gave us a heads up about. Let me just mention what it is first. Paul Ranitsky, a composer who really his intervention kind of <laughs> got us interested yeah. in. This is um, Paul Ranitsky's Three String Quartets. Now, this is the first time we're hearing any chamber music by him because it's been all orchestral music so far. Well, we started out with that orchestra recording. I think I found it. Neither one of us had heard of Ranitsky before. And right. after we discussed that, Daniel, the world expert of Ranitsky history and recordings and scores, got in touch with us right away. And it's been an interesting relationship since then. He even came to visit us in Japan. We actually went out one night. That was amazing. <laughs> So he gave us a heads up that this was coming out. So thanks to Daniel, as always, even though he wasn't involved in this recording. So for any listeners that are new to Ranitsky, be sure to check out Daniel's Ranitsky Project homepage for more historical information and music scores. Also, if you haven't heard it, go back and check out our interview with Daniel and Merrick Stillitz, the Czech Philharmonic conductor on those uh, Ranitsky orchestral recordings. And there's a lot of interesting and really fun music to check out on those recordings. But tonight we're dealing with something completely different, chamber music. This was really interesting. The first chamber music I've heard by Ranisky, and I think you too, right? Yes. We haven't heard any of this. I'm not sure that any of it has been recorded yet. I haven't seen any out there. But Three String Quartets by Paul Ranisky. This is performed by the Alma Viva Quartet, who are Eva Borghi and Peter Barksy, or Peter Barksy on violins. I'm probably not saying these are names right. (laughs) Werner Saller on viola. And Melanie Beck uh, cello. And this is on the CPO Records label. Mm. They're German-based, I believe. Now, the Alma Viva Quartet played these quartets on period instruments. That means uh, Mozart's era, so gut strings and older instruments. I actually didn't check which instruments they were. It turns out Paul Ranitsky composed 54 string quartets. Wow. Wow. And, of course, the Alma Viva Quartet, is decided they wanted to do a recording of um, Ranitsky string quartets. Which ones do you do? <laughs> when yeah, you have 54 really. to choose from. Anyway, they decided to go for a cross section of them. So the they decided to record Opus 2, number 2, which was composed before 1790 from Ranitsky's early period. Opus 32, number 4. These are both in G major, which is kind of interesting. They choose, yeah. chose two at the same key. Um, that's from 1798, his middle period. And his last quartet, and I'll give you the punchline now, the one I thought that was the most interesting. They were all good, but that one was really interesting. Opus 49 from 1804. Now, 1804 is the year after Beethoven's Eroica Symphony was first heard. So right. we, we often think, oh, well, Beethoven changed music in 1803, but you know that doesn't happen. In 1803, the Eroica Symphony was heard, but still, older styles of music are continuing. It takes time for everybody to catch up with the, the people who are really moving music right. forward. So we have to keep that in mind. There's a Woody Allen joke where well, it's medieval times and he says, oh, the Renaissance is coming. I'd better do this fast because pretty soon we'll all be painting. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't happen. No. Just, things just kind of continue and things slowly change. Anyway, tracks one through three. These are all three movement string quartets. The first one on the album is G major, opus 32, number four. Now these quartets haven't been... We understand that there are 54 of them, but they haven't been numbered yet. Some scholar is going to have to go through and hopefully number them one day. Maybe it'll be Daniel. Yeah. <laughs> you don't know. But it's how I like to know like numbers. It just helps me to remember. I don't know where to right. place them. Is Opus 32 the middle or the beginning? You know, did he write a lot in his early years or who knows? But this is the middle period quartet. Opus 32, number four, G major. And the uh, booklet notes, I've uh, written down some booklet notes here. It exhibits operatic traits in all three movements. Michael Colton, who is the booklet note writer, states that at the beginning, one almost thinks that one is hearing timpani and trumpets with various characters coming out on the imaginary stage. Hmm. 
There's much that recalls ensemble scenes in a buffo opera. Yeah, I agree with that. Symphony and trumpets, okay. Well, I know what he means, but I, right. <laughs> I wasn't imagining that. Okay. The movement also exhibits traces of sonata form, and I actually kind of underline the word traces, because this isn't really a sonata the way we think about it. Now, at the time, sonata form was very fluid. Now, Mozart and Haydn had kind of landed in this thing that we now call sonata form, but other composers weren't necessarily doing that. There's a fantastic book, by the way, by Charles Rosen called Sonata Forms, which is pretty technical, that kind of examines this. Sonata form isn't a mold that you pour your music into and then it just comes out like your Christmas cookie is like shaped like a sonata. They were just experimenting with these different ways of putting this material out there to create drama. It's like an opera. It sort of creates a sense of drama or narrative. So there's a first theme, a second theme, and a middle part of developmental character, but Ranitsky keeps a great distance from the strict formal processes that became established during his years in Vienna. Yeah, one of the reasons sonata form like emerged as the form that you would do this in is because Haydn and Mozart just wound up being so influential. Right. So let's uh, get into the uh, quartet here. The first movement is marked Allegro, and it's recorded close with ample room sound. The fortes reverberate in the space, which sounds empty, and are sharply played. They're clear, though. There's no problem with that. The opening melody is very pretty. Let's just get into it. Let's hear it. Okay, so there we go, and we're on our way. There's some immediately intriguing changes of key to get us into the second theme, which is played in harmony with only an arpeggiated accompaniment keeping the rhythm moving. There's a charming false cadence, uh, one that just passed the two-minute mark. There are actually several of these. And also, there's a sudden darkening into the minor at two minutes and 40 seconds, only to bound back into the sunlight of the major key in what sounds like the end of the section, but there's no solid cadence, and we get a repeat at the beginning of the third minute. Harmonically, this is very interesting. We get into a developmental section at around the six-minute mark, or possibly before. With Ranitsky's harmonic tricks here, it's hard to say exactly where the joins are. They're obscured by the material. At 7.35, we arrive back at the opening theme. The material goes into some surprising harmonic places as the work goes on. This really doesn't qualify quite as a recapitulation. All of the original material doesn't repeat in a new key or the second theme in a new key the way Mozart and Haydn wound up doing it. But the end arrives at harmonic balance, nevertheless. Attractive melodies are heard throughout, and that's the important thing. So I think you'll enjoy that. The second movement is an adagio, and it's a variation movement. Uh, the opening theme features smooth moving harmony in the entire quartet, outlining the theme clearly. The first variation gets more wavering lines from the lead, and the second features figuration from the first violin. So as the variations go on, they get more complex, or they add some new element. The third features a dramatic statement from the lower instruments, answered by the higher ones. This goes off into some varied shapes, and toward the end we hear a more cheerful variation with a bit of a lift in its step. A more poignant section is heard in the seventh minute, leading to rhythmically lively approach in the somber concluding chords. The third movement, Rondo, marked Allegro, has a folk character and country dance character too, which is really unmistakable. The Almaviva Quartet makes the rhythm dance too, which is always appreciated in my case. All themes are charming in this movement, and there's a rather nice key change at 2 minutes and 27 seconds, lightening the mood further. The harmony lightens as the end is approached, leading to a satisfying cadence on the last two chords. Let's hear the beginning of the Rondo theme.
All right, I'm going to have to leave us uh, off there. That's really dancey there. It's dancey. Not only that, I always feel like it's the countryside. And you know what? When I hear music like this, I always think it's warm there, too. <laughs> it's right now, it's not warm. <laughs> not like here, yeah. Yeah, not like here. It's winter is coming. Anyway, you can warm yourself up uh, with this um, country dance in the third movement. Okay, tracks four through six are string quartet in G major again. This time, opus two, number two. So this is an early string quartet. Possibly his second published string quartet. I don't know what his opus mm. one was. But the first movement is marked Adagio and Allegro non molto. He seems to write these string quartets in three movements. He doesn't use the um, scherzo. He goes for the Vivaldi fast, slow, fast. Vivaldi established this right. kind of form. All right, so the first movement starts with a false lead with an introduction suggesting majesty, according to the booklet notes. After a few measures of the gravity of the adagio goes over into a moderated allegro full of song-like mellowness. And this is, these are um, Colton's words again. There are bold harmonic processes in the middle, he says. I say the opening is a unison line followed by a harmonized answer. I should mention that the Almaviva play these quartets with no vibrato. Okay, so they're playing in the period style as well. So instead of getting this kind of like sort of vibrato or vocal sound. It's more of like a nasal sound. It's still vocal, but instead of like coming from the throat, it sounds like it's more from the nose. At a minute and four seconds, we hear the more cheerful Allegro non molto, and I want to sample that, so I'm going to fade up for this one. into a, <laughs> yeah. an interesting harmonic uh, detour there, right in a, an early quartet. Very interesting. The themes are all charming, as you just heard, and the composition is yeah, pretty straightforward with the exposition, but there are some striking key changes, even in the exposition, if I can call it that, and especially in the middle section. They don't jump out, though, due to any dynamic changes, which we really um, are drawing attention to. They're all smoothly taken. Just after the fourth minute, the opening theme repeats, and there's a lovely contrasting slow section just before the final chords, recalling the tone of the introduction, which I skipped in the um, sample. The middle movement is poco adagio, movement two, con sordini, so this is played with mutes on the violins. It has a melancholy tone, contrasting with the first movement, and this is Michael Colton again. An interlude shifts to major, but things go back to melancholy by the end. This has a suggestion of a Siciliano rhythm to the theme. I'm talking now. It sounds like this is a series of variations, and after the theme, we hear one of the violins accompany with pizzicato. After this, the theme changes, picking up a more sustained accompaniment. The Alma Viva play this sensitively. It's really appealing. At 2 minutes and 20 seconds, there's a move to the minor key and a more lamenting take on the theme. At the 3 minute mark, there's a sort of recitative by perhaps the viola. I like the hush the Almaviva manage at the end of the movement. It helped by the uh, mutes, of course. And the third movement, Adagio going to Allegro non molto. So again, this has a strong dance character, al ongarese, and it shines with rhythmic tricks and fast modulations. It comes across as lively, though the dance rhythm doesn't get the downbeat accent that we heard in the previous quartet. The melody comes across most strongly here. The rhythmic tricks come in the form of unexpected pauses, followed by a continuation of the theme. At a minute and four seconds, we have a droning accompaniment suggesting the countryside, you know, the musette, which is kind of like a bagpipe instrument. Right. Themes are all immediately appealing. The movement ends playfully with contrast and dynamics and a modestly quiet ending. Okay. The third string quartet on this album is in D minor, opus 49, and this was my favorite one, so I want to talk about this quite a bit. It's the most complex work on the album. Michael Colton in his notes tells us that the dynamic element is more pronounced than in the earlier quartets and exhibits parallels to Ranitsky's friend Beethoven. I can see what he means by that, but this is closer to Mozart as far as the way the music flows than it is to Beethoven, because Beethoven likes to play a lot of rhythmic tricks and um, odd accents right. and things like that. The rhythm in the first and third movements is extremely complicated. A lack of clarity results, and it seems this is the effect Ranitsky wanted. <laughs> oh, it's pretty forward-looking for him. 
First movement is marked allegro assai, so very allegro. There are long modulations in this, and Raniski doesn't use any current formal model, I'll say. This is a pretty long movement at nine minutes, and uh, if you know what a sonata, how a sonata goes, you can kind of pick out the sections and kind of follow it that way. So that when you don't have a formal model, it's really hard to know what to listen for. So you wind up just listening to the melodies, and you don't know what's going to happen to them. Any repeats of thematic material is only rarely recognizable, according to Colton. Anyway, this starts with a unison statement, always a bold move. The opening is melodic, and the first theme seems to be the three long notes followed by a winding response. There's a second theme, very attractive, starting at the 52-second uh, mark, so let's hear that. Indeed, where is that theme going at the end? It seems like I've <laughs> walked into a new theme entirely. It's pretty interesting music, I have to say, and it's all very pretty, so it's easy to listen to. The melodies are elegant in the way we associate with Mozart, at least I do. At the 2 minute and 14 second mark, the opening of the work repeats, but goes off in another direction harmonically, as though this were a development. As the work goes on, there are some surprising sudden key changes, which I guess is something that um, Ranitsky likes to do. While material doesn't necessarily repeat, one is so absorbed by the beautiful themes that one doesn't notice. There are a lot of surprising melodic turns, and I guess you could say developmental invention in this movement. In fact, the movement seems like a very long development after a brief exposition. It simply keeps moving. By the 8 minute and 10 second mark, we do seem to have a conclusion to a recapitulation. So, in other words, there's a conclusion, it sounds like we've already heard the recapitulation. So this movement is melodic and unpredictable. There's a pretty cool roiling approach to the ending figures and a surprising continuation after what sounds like the final chord in the ninth minute. That's going to happen in the third movement as well. Second movement, Largo con Sordino, again with the mute. The violin's wavy figures suggest improvisation and segments recur with variation. And I haven't sampled a middle movement yet, so let's hear the beginning of this one. It reminds me a little bit of a classical opera theme a character mm. might sing. It's very song-like. By the 42nd mark, and we, we just heard that part, the beginning, the music gets into a light dancing rhythm uh, that comes and goes. It's not a dance. It's more of like an accompaniment to a song melody. And it alternates with straight melodic statements. Again, as the material goes on, the guys the melodies appear in always come as a surprise. At 3 minutes and 54 seconds, there's a highly muted pianissimo section, leading to 4 minutes and 6 seconds, where we hear the opening of the work again. I hope I got that time right. Anyway, in the fifth minute, there are several key changes and sudden changes of direction that really grab the ear. A sudden dancing rhythmic change comes at 6 minutes and 30 seconds. We get a pleasant ending cadence after all of this. The finale, marked presto, is, according to Michael Colton, musical fireworks. Twice in the movement, we seem to have reached the D minor concluding chord, always bland here, making us feel disappointed, according to Colton, but then we're led to the actual finale. It's a really nice trick. Anyway, it's got a dramatic opening with slashing chords breaking up the melody. Yeah, he says bland, but I think he, what he means is predictable, like he wants that sense of predictability and then the rug is pulled out from under us. Anyway, the piece has a dramatic opening with slashing chords breaking up the melody, then rushing figures. Let's hear the opening to this.
And then we go into something a little more melodic there. Now those slashed accents. Those are cool, yeah. Yeah, a little rem reminiscent of Beethoven. And they're going to wind up being thematic in this movement. They actually help give us a sense of where we are. That rhythm kind of draws our ear and will kind of, it'll give us a sense of our place in the movement. By the one minute and 10 seconds section, we get into a more straightforward melody, sounding like it's heading to a cadence, which it does at a minute and 34 seconds, but it's quickly off without rest to a new theme that sounds like it might cadence at any minute, and it does at two minutes and eight seconds. Then there's a theme that leads us to the opening figures again. At four minutes and 32 seconds, we're off to more mysterious material. What follows sounds like a development section with figures keeping their shape while changing keys. Something like a recapitulation begins in the sixth minute, but it's not exactly the same as the opening. We hear the same figures reorchestrated and even rearranged. The D minor finale comes at about 30 seconds before the end, after which the finale is extended by a quiet theme and ends with the slashing opening figures that lead to the tonic. So it's kind of like a you know surprising and rather dramatic ending too. So... If you like string quartet music, you really can't go wrong with this. It's appealing and it's new. You haven't heard this before. It really is a must hear. The album features three very attractive string quartets, all with enough depth to make the listener want to repeat the experience of listening to them in order to probe further. And just to let these gorgeous, well-formed melodies wash over one and perhaps take root in your brain so that you can think of them when you're not listening to the music. I personally found the D minor quartet the last one, to be the most engaging, but all three are fantastic and sound really fresh here. It's familiar in that it uses the harmonic language of the classical era, yet all new because these are works we haven't heard before, and the form the music takes keeps one guessing. I could spend long hours with these quartets trying to figure them out, trying to kind of get like a, a sense of how they go. There's a quite a bit of harmonic and rhythmic sleight of hand to go with the very attractive melodies. And the Alma Viva Quartet play these as though they've been playing them for years. I mean, they sound really familiar and comfortable with them. They seem to have the shape of these works firmly in hand as well. I highly recommend this release. We've heard Ranitsky's orchestra works, symphonies, overtures, and concertos, and it was an interesting contrast to hear some chamber music. A lot of his composer personality traits seem consistent here. The great gift for melody, quirky little harmonic diversions, and rhythmic advances charging ahead to pauses and then pulling back. These are packed with lots of developed ideas, but shaped to surprising forms. We don't know what direction things are going to go. And also really long <laughs> movements with lots of development. And so you're constantly led in different directions. It's all pretty exciting, but it always sounds great because these melodies are so endearing even on a first listen. So yeah, I was just as intrigued by this. I guess I'm more of a fan of the orchestral works, but I was really entertained and pleased by these. So I hope we can hear more chamber music from Rinitsky in the future as well. Yeah, if you have an understanding of harmony, too, these are really going to appeal to you because yes. they go in some really interesting harmonic directions. You can hear that. Even if you don't understand harmony, you can still hear the odd turns. It, it'll strike you, you know, even if you're not sure of what exactly is happening. So give them a listen, I'd say. Absolutely. Yeah, the next album we're going to talk about is Profession by one of our favorite uh, artists, Sean Shibe on the yeah. guitar. We've heard a few of his uh, records. In fact, I chose... Um, his electric guitar album last year is one that of my favorite albums yeah. of the year. It was interesting, yeah. I, and I still listen to it because it was kind of atmospheric and, yeah, really interesting. Anyway, Sean Chibet records for the Pentatone label these days, and this record is on that label. And the title, Profession, comes from a poem by Barrios, who you may remember we heard a few weeks ago. Right. Played by Thibaut Garcia, a full album of his music. He features um, on this album, too, in fact... Um, the two pieces are also on the Thibaut Garcia album. They're different here, though. It's kind of interesting to compare them. Anyway, Barrios, um, in the poem, explains how Tupa, the supreme spirit and protector of, quote, my people, by which I guess he means the Guarani people of Paraguay, who he sort of associated with. So this protector, Tupa, gifted him a box and told him to reveal its secrets. After some more magical occurrences, he's able to draw forth from the box a marvelous symphony of all the virgin voices of America. This album attempts to expose those voices as well. We might want to keep that in mind when we listen, because there's some really unusual <laughs> and rather uh, dark music on this album. And I don't want to say dark, let's say violent 
music on this album. Now, if you mm. don't think of the acoustic guitar as a violent instrument, this is something you really need to hear because it might change <laughs> your mind. This is a really interesting album. Anyway, Sheba himself provides the program notes for the album, or one of them. There are two actually program notes. Hugh Morris writes the other program. It mostly focuses on how Andre Segovia neglected all of the works on this album, <laughs> despite being friendly with the composers. This is mostly because he favored European music. He was Spanish. And all of the works here are Latin American. So you see this happens even yep. <laughs> between native Spanish speakers as well. Hugh Morris writes the program notes on each of the individual compositions. Anyway, track one, we start with Hector Villalobos, who's going to be... Um, the main composer on this album. We hear mostly his music. This is his prelude number three in A minor, homage to Bach, from five preludes, W419 or A419. Two of those numbers are the same on all the compositions on this album. Anyway, let's just get right into this sound world and hear a little bit of this opening piece. Oh, by the way, this track isn't on Deezer. I didn't check other streaming sites. I just realized this now because I have a CD. Let's uh, just hear this opening Villa Lobos track. So I think the first thing you want to notice here is Sean Shiba's really bold attack on this uh, track. That's going to get bolder as the album goes on. There's a lot of reverb on the recording, as though recorded from a bit of a distance in a large empty hall. And there's a reason for that, because by the time we get to the Hinastera work at the end, <laughs> we're going to need that distance in order for the uh, music to be recorded without distortion. The mic is close enough here to pick up the attack, though Shiba is a truly hypnotic player and makes every note of this work come alive. He's got an expressive timbre, which is partly obscured by the recording, but nevertheless registers on this track. That's not going to be the case later on. There's a very sensitively played series of descending patterns from just before the two-minute mark that Shiba especially draws a lot of feeling out of. He plays the repeated opening gently and quietly at the end. Okay, so that track isn't on streaming, apparently. It's only on the CD, and it starts out the album. It's kind of a one-off. The next piece, which is the first track on streaming, it's the second track on the CD, so you're going to have to subtract one from my um, track listings here. So CD tracks 2 through 4, and streaming tracks 1 through 3, are Augustin Barrios Mangore, La Cathedral. Barrios is his name. Mangore is the name he took when he kind of associated with the Guarani, himself with the Guarani people. We heard this uh, a few weeks ago on Thibaut Garcia's recording, and it's a three-movement work. The first movement is uh, Preludio, Saudade, which Saudade is a memory. I hope I said that right. Let's just give a listen to the opening of this. Very different from the uh, Thibault Garcia mm -hmm. recording that we heard uh, a few weeks ago. Shiba gets a lighter sound and a lot of contrast between the melody in the high end and the accompanying arpeggios. The second movement, Andante Religioso, is a movement where Barrios captures something of the awe upon hearing Bach being played on the organ of Montevideo's Cathedral of San Jose de Mayo. The movement is poised and austere, and I liked Shiba's way with the second half of this movement, sounding like an approaching procession in its crescendo. Beautiful harmonics at the end, too. Track three, and uh, movement three, track four on the CD, Allegro Solemne captures the rush of the city streets around the cathedral. This also starts with a bit of a hush over it. I find myself leaning towards the speakers to catch a lot of the quiet detail. <laughs> Don't worry, that'll change by the time we reach the end of the album. 
the performance has a lot of finger squeaks on the fretboard. This is going to be a frequent uh, thing on this recording. We're going to hear a lot of uh, finger squeaks. He's really working to play these pieces. Uh, nevertheless, it's impressive in its expressiveness, and there's a powerful popped last chord setting us up for what we're going to hear later. The fifth track, or the fourth track on the streaming, is um, Julia Florida by um, Barrios. We heard that on Thibaut Garcia's album, too. This has beautiful expression, but I feel like uh, some of the counter-melodic accompanimental detail is getting lost in the reverberant room. Still, Shiba shapes the yearning moments of this melody perfectly. He has a way with romantic works. He'll do an almost unnoticeable decrescendo in a way that draws the listener's ear closer to the sound. Listen to the hushed last statement of the theme toward the end of the piece. I like the way he captures yeah. the uh, sighing quality in those upward moving mm. moments and just the tenderness is just really beautiful in this. Okay, on streaming tracks 5 through 16, Hete Villa Lobos 12 studies, W235A235. This is all 12 of them <laughs> that we're going to hear. And uh, they're kind of interesting because they start as homages to other composers and then by the end we're squarely in Latin America and in Villa Lobos territory. So it is kind of a bit of a journey to get through them all. These studies are still unmatched in their scale, difficulty, and creativity. The first one, track six, or track five, I guess I should say, streaming, Allegro non troppo, is a meeting between Villa Lobos and Andre Segovia, which led to this etude. It's an homage to Chopin and features a similar technique to one of his etudes. Shibe gets an intense sound here with quite a few squeaks on the fretboard as well. Not an issue, really, but I'm wondering why there's so much of it on this album and not on his other albums. <laughs> I'm wondering if it's the intensity of the playing, or maybe he has a new guitar. I really don't know. Okay, the second of the um, studies also sounds like Chopin with its wide-ranging arpeggios. Shibe plays this at an impressive speed, yet maintains all of the musicality in the piece. Uh, it sounds as hard as one of uh, Chopin's etudes, so let's listen to this. Actually, now that I hear this, I'm thinking Bach by way of Paganini. <laughs> you know, it's like Paganini technique, but Bach kind of chord changes. Moving on to uh, the third study, features an accented chord followed by figuration circling back to the chord. The middle section slows a bit, and then we're back to the opening speed when the opening repeats. The fourth, un po modere, booklet writer Hugh Morris says there's an evocation of choro groups here. This features quickly strummed chords forming the melody. The opening reaches a climax at a minute and seven seconds and a decrescendo and diminuendo follows. The strummed figuration continues throughout the four minute and 30 second piece. Shiba always getting a strong visceral attack, strumming hard, especially at the end. It's an odd piece where the chords sound damped like on the piano where you know they're not allowed mm. to ring out. Let's uh, hear the ending of this piece. Thank you.
there's a harsh, almost like menace to that theme. <laughs> Boy, you don't really think of the acoustic guitar as sounding like that. Anyway, the fifth study, Andantino, has different voices moving in various directions. The bass is ostinato, and this is rather cheerful and immediately appealing. Uh, the melodies here are all folk-like. Let's sample this. The sixth study, Poco Allegro, has powerfully strummed chords at the beginning. It's got a Spanish character to its strummed chords, but there's a rising and descending line that takes away that character. Bookload author Hugh Morris says this one has Rachmaninoff characteristics. Hmm. I'm wondering what he means by that. <laughs> anyway, the seventh study, Très Anime, has a distant quality to its relatively quiet dynamic. There's a melody in the upper range where the accompaniment is ostinato, chord arpeggios. At a minute and 56 seconds, the character changes and there are some more virtuosic runs in the melody. The sound is mezzo forte and present. The piece ends on a tremolo followed by a run to a single resolving note. The eighth study, Modere, moving to Lente, which is slow, has a heavy bass tread. The pacing is slow and deliberate, Eventually, a melody in the higher end is arrived at, and it's very pretty, with strummed chords and arpeggiated chord accompaniment. Throughout these works, I should mention, Shiba is getting his characteristic, expressive, lightly vibrato sound on the melody. This ends on a harmonic chord. Actually, that sound really makes him identifiable as the guitarist. I think I could possibly pull him out of a group of recordings mm -hmm. as the guitarist, because he does have an approach or a quality to his sound that's identifiable. The uh, ninth study, Trepo Anime, descending pattern at the opening, soft and appealing. The pattern arrives at a repeating harmony at the 44 second mark, and there's a pause. And we arrive at the opening pattern again. It's an odd moment. There's some delicate playing from a minute and 30 seconds that's impressive by Shibe. It shows virtuosity of touch as well as technique, and I would like to sample that. You want to hear those beautiful descending bass notes with those really flowery uh, yeah. patterns on top of it. It's hard to do. The tenth study, Très Anime, starts with a repeating pattern on a single harmony, evoking some sort of natural sound, perhaps drums. The theme starting at about the 30-second mark features some impressive hammer-on pull-offs in the high end played simultaneously with the bass melody, and it has a powerfully strummed ending. Now, that powerful strumming is going <laughs> to remain for the rest of the album. The 11th study, Lant, sounds a bit like a lament in its minor mode and lower mid-range melody. This would be an example of what Hugh Morris describes as more violent guitaristic effects. Indeed, Shibe really attacks the instrument here, as though trying to damage it. <laughs> uh, let's hear an example. Yeah, this is really surprising.
Yeah, and <laughs> it develops from there. The twelfth study, anime, again, very impressive virtuosity here, especially due to the forced articulation of the opening chords. Shibe is getting a lot of finger squeaks in this too, but they blend in with the maniacal figures he's playing. One wonders what got into Villalobos when composing the second half of this set of studies. The first half sounded like homages, yet the second half evokes a more violent inspiration. Let's hear a little bit of this study too. Okay, violent attack on the strings and really solid virtuosity as well. Boy, and that's the end of the studies, but there's one work left. Alberto Hinastera, Argentinian composer, his sonata, Opus 47, a new work to me. It's a four-movement work, and uh, the first movement is marked Esordio, and the opening chord is formed by the open strings of the guitar, E-A-D-G-B-E. -E. It's strummed fortissimo and is followed by a promising arpeggiated figure up the frequency range of the guitar. These chords are played forcefully, so we're not far away from Villa Lobos' approach in the latter studies. Let's hear the opening of this work with that open, kind of strummed beginning. <laughs> say I really like the way Shibe will go for an ugly tone in order to get an expressive quality rather than maintain like a really beautiful tone. I really admire that when uh, classical musicians do that because they're really trained to have a beautiful sound, right. which Shibe has when he wants to. Most of the movement consists of loud, forcefully played arpeggiated chords like what we heard in the sample. The music grows quiet at the end and also features gentle tapping on the body of the guitar. Yeah, we're going to use the whole instrument here. In the second movement, the scherzo, I'm wondering how some of the sounds of the opening of this piece are made. <laughs> Maybe you can write in and tell me. I've, I've never seen a score, but let's listen to the opening of this. This would really be some experience seeing someone play this in front of you, you know, with all those effects. Hina said his compositions often get wild, and that's the case here, with glissandos that seem on the verge of going out of control. We heard them from uh, Shiba there. Shiba achieves the effect with a feeling of abandon. This movement features all sorts of interesting sounds, including plucked either behind the bridge or near the tuning pegs, I can't really tell which, and banging on the guitar's body. We heard a bit of that. This does not sound easy to play, and that's probably why I haven't heard it until now. It's a bold choice for Shibe to program. Like the first movement, this one grows very quiet towards the end, and after a sudden outburst, Shibe achieves a music box quality before ending the movement by violently snapping the strings. The third movement, Kanto, is a fairly dissonant set of chords opening the movement, followed by lines punctuated by harmonics. There are frequent loud pops on the strings after a phrase. The dynamics are extreme and are in extreme contrast with each other. This movement, after acting up, ends tranquilly. 
The finale is attached to the canto, the previous movement, and the opening features an odd time signature and a crescendo that gets impressively loud. There's some slashing sound at about the uh, 55 second mark. We're going to hear that in this sample, so stay tuned. I can only imagine his hands must be really like bloody by the time <laughs> this piece is over. Boy, the whole section features a lot of powerful sounds amidst the rhythmic excitement. The movement is brief, but it's a thrilling end to a compelling and ear opening program. We get the beautiful playing we're familiar with from Sean Shibe in the first half of the album, and something altogether new and unexpected from him in the second. A roughly played, deliberately unbeautiful tone is heard for a lot of the second half, and now I understand why this recording was so distantly recorded, for the sake of those latter works that you heard sampled at the end, which register with great forcefulness. I'd say this program comes into its own in the second half, showing us another side of Shibe's expressive character, as well as his adventurousness with the music he plays. It's an acoustic guitar album, but not one for the faint-hearted. It's pretty adventurous, in fact, and guitar players themselves would love it due to the explorations of the sounds that are possible on the acoustic guitar. So, an adventurous album, highly recommended, but um, don't try to fall asleep to this. Every time we hear Shibe, he's trying something new, a different approach with different kinds of music. This one was interesting as well. I mean, you're always going to get impressive technique and interesting tones. The sound of this guitar is really quite interesting. Starting out on the Barrios, he, as you mentioned, you notice that distance right away. You get this kind of soft but ringing acoustic. It can get quite loud because of the distance, so he has a potential dynamic range that he exploits really well. Getting into the studies, you know, these Villalobos are studies, but he puts a lot of feeling into them, and mm. there's, you know, a lot of dynamic playing and changes in them, and I like the different tempos, all kinds of different approaches, descending lines and undulating movements throughout there. And the Hinastera, well, whenever I think of Hinastera, I think histrionic, and that it kind of <laughs> applies here. These are really cool and rhythmic. I felt a bit worn out by them by the end, but for a Hinastera composition, I was really drawn into it, and I found it kind of enjoyable. I like the big rhythmic ending, and as you say, the program builds to the end and gives you that big dynamic surge in those last pieces. So yeah, I'd say this is a winner. You never know what he's going to do next, but I was thoroughly engaged and excited throughout this performance. Yeah, this is a guitarist um, that you're going to want to keep up with every album he puts out, because he seems to have a lot of ideas and yeah. uh, a lot of different approaches to his instrument. I'm really already interested in what's coming next, although I'll be listening to this quite a bit, I'd say. Yeah. All right, so the last classical recording of 2023 that we're going to talk about on the <laughs> Adult Music Podcast is a recording I was attracted to really because of the title and the composer, John Pickard, that I know a bit about because I've heard some of his uh, earlier works. This album is called Mass in Troubled Times, and being that we sort of uh, live in Seems like troubled it. times yeah. that seem to be getting more and more troubled as we go. I keep hoping the new year is going to bring something uh, better. I thought we'd end uh, with this and just uh, a thought about that. So John Pickard, Mass in Troubled Times, performed by the BBC Singers, conducted by Martin Brabens. And this is on Beast Records, and it's an SACD if you have the SACD, which I do not. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I might pick it Not up yet. one day. We'll see. Not yet, anyway, yeah. Are you listening, Santa? Yeah. <laughs> Mike wants the mass Mike in wants a times. lot of things <laughs> <laughs> that he didn't get this year because of the uh, weak yen, which actually is gaining in Coming strength now, yeah. finally. Yeah. It's still not good, but it's a lot better than it was just only a few weeks ago, really. 
Okay, Picard, born in 1963, studied with William Matthias and Louis Andriessen, two composers that I know a bit about, and uh, they're both really excellent, so he has good uh, credentials here. He's known for his orchestral works and string quartets. I've heard a lot of his orchestral works, in fact. And he writes uh, choral works when the opportunity arises, so the Latin motets on this recording are all occasional pieces. Now, when we say occasional, it means for an occasion, for a special occasion, so... If you write a piece for somebody's birthday, that would be an occasional piece. <laughs> Tracks one through three, three Latin motets for choir a cappella. These were written from 1983 to 1987. The first one is called Onata Lux for soprano, alto, tenor, bass. This one was composed in 1983 during the final year of Picard's undergraduate studies at the University of Bangor as one of the weekly exercises for his composition teacher, William Matthias. Now, I'm guessing Bangor is in England, not in, not in Maine. Yeah. <laughs> That's a different Bangor. This moves along with a strong sense of line. The harmonies are generally consonant, with some intriguing passing dissonances. The text is sung straight through and is easily understandable. It's an attractive piece. Nothing fancy here. The second of the Latin motets, Te Lucis Ante Terminum, for sopranos and altos only, this is for women's voices, mm -hmm. 1987, and the decision to make the women's voice piece the middle movement brings a nice contrast to the mixed choir in the first work. The text is a prayer for the end of the day that God will guard the vocalists. The middle section adds some dynamic contrast, rising higher and louder. The first verse repeats at the end, and the piece ends quietly. The third, Ubi Caritas Et Amor, soprano alto tenor bass, written in 1985, uh, means where charity and love are, God is there. This is the most adventurous of the three motifs. It breaks up the text more, though all voices sing the same syllables at the same time, and the piece goes into some unexpected harmonic territory at times. As the text goes on, the sound of the choir warms up and comforts the listener more. The amen at the end features a solo female vocal line, Let's just listen to the opening of this work so that we can get an idea of what this sounds like. Track four is O Magnum Mysterium, which is a Christmas piece for choir a cappella, soprano, alto, tenor, bass, written in 2015. It was written for a Christmas carol concert at the University of Bristol. And again, this is set so the text is easily distinguishable as the syllables are, are all sung together. There's something about the harmony of Christmas carols that lets you know they're intended for Christmas. You can almost identify them out of other choral works. There's something funny about them that way. And that quality is present in this piece. This starts warmly and rises to a louder dynamic level. The Alleluia at the end of the text is fully half of the piece. And one can't complain about that with the lovely melodic shapes the word takes on here. Let's uh, hear a bit of the Alleluia and uh, see if you can identify this uh, Christmas quality that I'm talking about. And that will take us to the end of that piece. Tracks five through seven are instrumental work, Orion, for trumpet and organ. Always an interesting combination there. This is written in 2004. Chloe Abbott is the trumpeter, and David Good plays the organ. This work celebrates some of the features of the constellation Orion, which we see in the Northern Hemisphere in the winter. So right now, if you live in the Northern Hemisphere, you just look up in the sky and you'll see Orion right above you. 
The first movement, track five, is called Nebula. It has an amorphous opening with elements emerging and coalescing into a definitive and dramatic statement. It starts with spacey high sounds from the organ descending to earth. The trumpet's got ample reverb halo around it, and I'm wondering if it's being aided by electronics. The sound is pure. The bass of the organ comes through powerfully. At a minute and 22 seconds, the piece reaches a grand fortissimo, which falls away for an imitative section with the trumpet leading. By the 2 minute and 30 second mark, the trumpet is in a fanfare-like line. After a brief organ interlude, the trumpet re-enters and brings the harmony upward. The organ lands on a powerful chord at 3 minutes and 35 seconds, and we hear a rumbling approach, heavy with bass and high trumpet, to the end. Second uh, movement, Ein Attack, takes its name from the easternmost star in Orion's belt. In Arabic, it means the girdle. The outer sections of the movement are dominated by the sound of the flugelhorn, and the fast middle section depicts a short hunting scene reflecting Orion's mythological status as the mighty hunter. The flugelhorn starts with a solo line and sounds a lot mellower here than the trumpet in the previous movement. We're close and can hear the attack on the instrument. The organ finally comes in at around the 1 minute and 10 second mark solemnly as the trumpet resumes its soliloquy. There's a twinkling quality to the organ's arpeggiated chord and shifting harmony. The middle section starts at 2 minutes and 56 seconds in the organ with sprightlier rhythm. The trumpet picks up, now it's a trumpet, uh, picks up on this and plays rapid fire repeated notes. The trumpet line is active throughout this section, and at 4 minutes and 50 seconds we're definitively back to the lighter opening section with spacey sounds from the organ. The bass notes on this instrument, quiet as they are, have great presence and will make the room shake if heard through a subwoofer. That's why I want this Super Audio <laughs> CD. We'll hear the flugelhorn again in the familiar thematic material of the opening, and the movement ends on a sustained chord. Okay, so I've saved the sample of this for the third movement, Betelgeuse, which is the most celebrated of all the red giant stars. The star is reaching the end of its life in this movement and will eventually swell up, and in real life too, and will eventually swell up and slough off its outer layer to form a ring, a planetary nebula, dispersing into the infinite depths of space. This image forms the final minutes of the work, where following a series of dramatic cadenzas and an ecstatic, rhythmically complex dance, the trumpet player moves off stage and plays from a progressively greater distance. A nice effect, but we're going to hear the opening of this movement. Here we are. to take a surround sound bath in that. <laughs> so we hear the majestic bass from the organ opening the movement, densely sounded chords. The trumpet plays those staccato lines, ending the line in its higher range. The movement basically moves via chord statements from the organ, with the trumpet then responding with ever-changing upward lines. At the 2 minute and 17 second mark, there's a sort of dance rhythm in the organ sounding rather heavy while the trumpet plays brief staccato lines. At 3 minutes and 48 seconds, expect your neighbors to start knocking on your door because there's a <laughs> magnificent outburst of low organ volume that quickly dissipates. Perhaps this is the supernova, the end of Betelgeuse. It made me jump out of my chair. At the 4 minute and 30 second mark, we hear the now distant trumpet playing from the other room. The organ plays thin-toned chords, and we can hear a light organ drone there, too. The end of the piece is icy, with the trumpet sending its sound back to us from a distance. It's now in another room playing. I guess I can't uh, let this go without um, <laughs> sampling the, the actual outburst there that's going to attract the neighbors. So let's hear that section here.
Sorry, Mr. And Mrs. Neighbor. I'll turn it down now. <laughs> That's not a good one for date night either there, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep that in mind. So we move on back to the choral works. Track eight, Ave Maristella for choir a cappella. This is written in 1992. It features elaborate textures and divides up into nine parts to create rich, slowly shifting sonorities, culminating in a triumphant E-flat major chord spread across three and a half octaves. This starts with some surprising harmonies that brighten up at the third line. There's a soaring soprano voice that comes in for the lines, Afunda nos in pace, establish us in peace. The writing is straightforward for the most part, Picard getting expression out of dynamics and the alternation of register and of the chorus, and solo soprano voice too. He writes in a way that makes the words always audible and understandable. By around the 3 minute and 28 second mark, the piece gets more ornate with more ringing high voices and ends in brightness. So let's hear a bit of the brightness of that ending. Surprising reach for the high note at the end there. Yeah. Track 9, Azimandias for Choir a Cappella. 1983, the text is by Percy Bishop Shelley. This is Picard's Opus 1, written when he was 19 years old, and it provides a stepping stone to the more dissonant areas of the Mass, which we're going to hear next. Soon. <laughs> the other motets are highly tonal. Scored for a 10-part choir, Shelley's sonnet, written in 1817, describes the shattered monument to the pharaoh Ramses, who is Ozymandias in Greek. The poem has a clear-eyed denunciation of tyranny that may be relevant today. This has some droning figures at the beginning. Declamation of the text by the chorus tends to be simultaneous, a technique Picard utilizes throughout, putting the words first. This is the most adventurous work on the album so far, <laughs> but it won't be for long. Uh, despite being the earliest Picard seems to have refined his style as the years went on, rather than expanded on the musical approach here. This sounds like it would be a challenge to perform, uh, more so than the previous works, actually. Track 10, Tesserae for organ. I really liked the idea behind this. It was written in 2009. David Good, the organist that we hear on this recording, is the dedicatee and first performer of this work. A tessera is an individual tile in a mosaic. This piece is constructed like a mosaic from several strongly differentiated musical fragments, this is according to the booklet notes, which are repeated and juxtaposed. No two repetitions are exactly the same, however, just as individual tiles tend to have minute differences. As the piece proceeds, the more similar types of fragment tend to attract each other and form more continuous spans, the same way that individual tesserae in a mosaic group together to form larger patterns. In this way, the first part of the work centers mainly on slow music with a hypnotic central section, while the latter part concentrates on fast, energetic material before the opening returns in a dramatic new context. So the opening motif is a quick upward ornamental scale to a theme. After this, quiet, solemn chords. The piece then starts alternating between the opening celebratory figure and the more solemn second, though they're different in profile here. At a minute and 58 seconds, we get a new set of sounds, the second part of which sounds almost like a marimba, and more new ideas are heard at longer time spans, and this really goes on for uh, 10 minutes. It's a pretty interesting piece, actually. I liked the whole sound of it. It just keeps building and building until sections are longer by the end. Tracks 11 through 16, here we are, the mass in troubled times for 18 unaccompanied voices, composed in 2018, and the text is written by Gavin DeCosta. It takes its name from Haydn's Misa in Angustis, composed in 1798 during the Napoleonic Wars and often known as the Nelson Mass. No direct connection between Picard's and Haydn's masses is intended beyond the title, but Picard says this work may be seen as a modern response to Haydn's work, written against a background of even greater global uncertainty. The work is a collaboration with the writer Gavin DaCosta. This is all from the... Uh, booklet, I should mention. I want to give credit to that. 
who drew on multiple sources across five languages. The ordinary of the Mass underpins the structure, though only 17 lines of the Mass itself are used. These lines are counterpointed with original poems unfolding a fictional narrative of a refugee father and daughter fleeing their war-torn country by sea. Alongside these elements are texts in three Middle Eastern languages, a Twitter hashtag in Turkish from 2015 concerning the fate of one Syrian refugee child, a passage from the Syriac Orthodox Church Liturgy of the Divine Mysteries, and two passages in Arabic from the Quran. The first part of the Shahada, the Muslim profession of faith, is heard, and a quotation from the Surah al waqiah I hope I said that right. The musical setting reflects the diversity of the texts. The Latin text of the Mass is treated in a largely polyphonic style, employing a range of imitative devices. The English poems are set simply and directly, with a concern for textual clarity. The Middle Eastern texts are set in a manner that does not seek to conceal their differences from the Western texts. So we go into the first movement, the introitus. The opening lines, Kiya Vuran Insanlik, is Turkish. I didn't say it right, I'm sure. But it means humanity washed ashore. It's repeated three times, and it's a reference to the hashtag used on 1 September 2015 for Turkish Twitter users with the photo of the three-year-old Syrian boy Elan Kurdi, who drowned during his family's failed attempt at a night crossing from Turkey to Greece. The intro it ends with words from the Roman Catholic Requiem Mass lines, All flesh shall come before you. The bass voices start the Twitter quote like a chant, and higher voices are layered in until the voices sound like lively separated chatter. One iteration has an organ-like texture in the harmony. I'm going to sample this from the beginning. You can get a feeling for what this mass sounds like. That is not an easy effect to pull off. We're hearing some pretty uh, fantastic uh, you know, layering of sounds there yeah. from the choir. Second movement, Kyrie. There are a lot of quotes from various sources, sort of like um, T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, whose first line is, April is the cruelest month, and that starts this Kyrie. It also includes texts from Syriac and from the Syriac Orthodox Church Liturgy of the Divine Mysteries. Harmony is stacked up here, and one text goes into another, with the women singing the Eliot quote and the men narrating the story of a missile killing people in Syria. This is the, the father-daughter poem. Now, the prayer at the end, sung by a solo male voice, is in Syrian. The third movement is a Gloria and starts with text from the Agnus Dei, <laughs> not the Gloria, in an escalating pattern and then descending pattern. I kind of wonder why he did that. Maybe he'll hear this and let us know. At around a minute and 30 seconds, the text turns to English with a narrative with the recurring refrain, Still Falls the Rain. The English texts in this work tend to be sung in a more straightforward, simultaneous style. After this, we finally hear the text from the Gloria, Et in terra pax hominibus bone voluntatis. This is a sung in a more polyphonic style with some clean, high voices from the sopranos. The men get a brief section to themselves in the fifth minute. I'd like to sample the uh, beginning of the Gloria. This is the line from the Agnus Dei part of the Mass that we hear in this. These kind of climbing lines make me kind of feel like arms, like outstretched, you mm. know, trying to reach the heavens or to get God's attention. The fourth movement, Credo, starts with a boldly declaimed Credo in Unum Deum in the traditional plain chant, which when repeated sounds more doubtful. 
The credo continues with male voices. Then we hear the first part of the Shahada, the Muslim profession of faith, in Arabic. This has a directly modal feel and reminds me of the publicly sounded Muslim call to prayer. When it moves to the choir, it's quietly harmonized. We then go to the English text with the repeating refrain, the sea is calm tonight, part of the poem of the father and daughter trying to find a life in this new land. The text here moves slowly and calmly, befitting the text. There are some high reaching from the sopranos in the fifth minute. We get what sounds like a cadence at the end of the English text, but the harmony descends from there, and we hear a repeat of the plain chant, credo statement, and the modal shahada at the uh, end. The fifth movement, Sanctus, starts with voices sounding in a ringing bell rhythm. Uh, this really kind of intrigued me, so let's uh, listen to this. get a chance there too but this movement goes on to further <laughs> more complicated uh, things it kind of reminds me of uh the christmas carol carol of the bells you know those you know right dun, 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 it kind of has a similar sort of effect but not once the harmony comes in because it gets dissonant and uh, has a buzzing quality to it there's interesting writing here and it's an exemplary performance as you can hear this develops into the wildest movement of the mass so far as the vocals go once the English poem comes in, the texture reduces to solo voices singing in a comfortable tonality. And this is followed by a quotation from the Quran in Arabic. When this comes in, it's chanted in a different mode than the tonality of the piece. The movement ends with the Benedictus minus the Hosanna. It's sung with solemnity and ends with beauty. The sixth movement, Agnus Dei, starts with the first line from William Blake's poem, The Lamb. And then a marching rhythm is established by the choir for the Agnus Dei. The Latin texts are the most avant-garde part of the setting of the Mass. There are some interesting harmonies at the end, and the piece ends on a high soprano note. So let's hear the end of this piece. And that's how the work and the album mm. ends. So the program starts with some more harmonically conservative pieces by Picard and works its way up to the more harmonically complex mass of the title. The singing is first rate throughout, which we can expect by the BBC singers under Martin Brabens. The most far-reaching piece is by far the title piece, The Mass, which features a lot of interesting juxtapositions of styles and harmony, with the English texts being the most tonal. The Arabic is sung in modes, and the Latin texts are the most out there. It kind of comes across as a music version, as I thought, of T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, with all these fragments sort of coming in and uh, having their say. Various unconnected parts occur in the framework. It all doesn't necessarily connect, but does send a rather scattered message of disquiet. I also like the solo organ work Tessere and the trumpet and organ work Orion. Both were inventive, and I like the contrast created between the organ and trumpet material. John Pickard's music is certainly interesting. The mass may take a little work, but it's worth hearing, and the engineering on this recording is fantastic. So a shout out to the engineer Pete Smith and producer Adrian Peacock. For me, I most preferred the vocal works on this recording. The hmm. motets create a very contemplative atmosphere. There's a great sense of tension and release with kind of unique use of harmonies, and I found that really uh, intriguing. 
the works at the beginning of the album are the easiest to yep. accept on the ear. And as the recording goes on, we get more and more dissonance introduced into the recipe with the uh, trumpet and organ work and then the organ and then those other vocal works getting us primed up for the mass which is a bit troubling in terms of dissonance. <laughs> I guess uh, it is. Yeah, it's not something that's going to put you into sort of a peaceful religious mind, but it is interesting. It's got a lot of buttons to press to uh, make you think about all the things you're hearing, and they're all really interesting. So it was very a very unique experience, as you say, kind of fragmentary in uh, composition and construction, but nevertheless, you know, hard to ignore all the interesting things that are going on. So I think as a composer, yeah, he's got a very intriguing profile and an interesting toolkit of different ideas that he puts together and you know across vocal and instrumental works so yeah i was uh, engaged throughout yeah and uh, listeners don't worry if you're troubled by this mass i will pull you out of this in the new year with my choices for <laughs> our first episode of the new year hopefully the new year will do the same but we'll have right. to see all right over on the jazz side we're going to be doing some traveling and the first stop a place I always like to go, Italy, Mike. No, oh, I love going to Italy myself. Always have a good time there when I visit, and I always have a good time with Italian jazz. It never disappoints me, and this one will be no exception. We've got a recording from guitarist Fabio Zepatella. It's called Jazz Masters. It's on Jando Music, and it came out November 30th. Now, Zepatella, born 1961, he's one of the top Italian guitarists and composers on the scene and he was well influenced by jazz masters like Charlie Christian, Wes Montgomery, and then through the hard bop of the 1960s. His resume of playing and recording associations has some big Italian names that we love. Stefano Di Battista, Enrico Rava, Paolo Fresu, and Fabrizio Bosso. Also international jazz names like Kenny Wheeler, Lee Konitz, and one of my favorite trumpet players of all time, Tom Harrell. On this recording, his associates here are Dato Moroni, another big name on the piano, Aris Tavalazzi on bass, and Fabrizio Sfera on drums. And all the compositions are original by Zepatella here, but they're sort of an ode to the jazz masters hinted at in the title. So let's jump right in, and you'll be able to guess most of these if you're a jazz fan from the titles. Track one, Mr. McCoy. Well, thinking, obviously, of pianist McCoy Tyner here, we've got some cool minor modal harmonies and an interesting meter feel here of alternating three and then five beats. So if we count those as separate measures, there's an intro and then an ABA melody of eight measure segments. So let's check out how this tune gets started. <laughs> Nice modal mood being created there. And Zepatella solo is first. He's got a warm tone and a nice sense of space in lines that let you digest what you've heard. While well, we're still on this track, but we want to get a sense of his soloing style. So let's hear some of what he does here as well in his solo. Thank you. 
Yeah, some nice modal scales weaving through the harmonies in fun ways. Moroni follows with a solo with ringing chords and busy figures, but really making it swing too. And Tavazzoli gets a bass solo, and he's rather laid back in approach before they take it through the melody again. Track two, Bird. Now we'd expect something boppy for Charlie Parker, and Zeppatella comes in improvising right away. Just bass and drums here under him as Moroni is sitting out until he gets a solo of his own. Follow the bass outline chords and the solo for your own confirmation. You get it? That's a jazz mm. joke. Uh, Charlie Parker's confirmation changes contrafact tune here. Guitar and piano trade fours with Sferas drums and then join in on the new unison melody that they saved for the end of the tune. And I like when mm. they do that sometimes. Track three, Wes for guitarist Wes Montgomery. This one has a relaxed loping swing feel and a bluesy tinged melody, AABA 32 measures. Zepatella takes it and continues on soloing. A nice fluid approach here and sprinkling in of double stops in the Montgomery style. Let's check out Moroni's solo on this one because it's very tasty. Nice running lines and rhythmic figures there. Tavolazzi gets a go on bass from there. And I guess his main style is very laconic, <laughs> at least from what we hear so far. Zepatella's is back with the melody from the B section to wrap it up. Track four, Waltz for Jim, and that would be the great guitarist Jim Hall. This tune has been recorded before 2014 on a recording with guitarist Umberto Fiorentino. Mm. Themes, variations, and metamorphoses. This is a dreamy intro that we should really check out first, so let's hear some of that. heartbeat bass kind of thing that uh, Tavolazzi gets going there. And Zepatella captures that smooth ease that characterized Jim Hall's sound. And the melody is in an AABA form with 16 measure sections in a 3-4 meter. And the changes here really evoke body and soul. Moroni has a lightly touched classy solo and Zepatella makes his solo melodic with fluid articulation. Let's hear some of that uh, Tavolazzi bass sound on his solo in this tune a little bit later on. Thank you. 
Zapatel is back there from the rising lines of the B section and an outro with more heartbeat based to end it up. Track 5, Monk. Thelonious Monk, of course, quirky and playful melody. Kind of reminds me of Well You Needn't, but more with rhythming like altered rhythm changes on this one. A, A, B, A, 32 measures. Nice interplay of piano and guitar on the B section and harmonic spiraling out before Moroni gets going on a solo. Let's hear the beginning of this tune. Lots of harmonic fun in his solo, and Zepatella has bouncy boppy lines in his own solo. Tavalazzi has a different approach to his bass solo here, with some vocalizations included. There's some playful trading for Sfera to get some drumming in before hitting the melody once more. Track 6, Lee, for Lee Konitz. This one has a kind of a New Orleans beat, a 16-measure intro, and then a jumpy syncopated interval 32-measure melody. Zepatella's solo has a lot of fun rhythmic and tumbling phrases ending with a cool bluesy line, and Moroni has a bouncy one here with some two-hand figures and tremolos. Let's hear some of that. It's pretty exciting. Another run through the quirky melody finishes it up for this tune. Track 7 is Miles. Moroni makes a ringing solo rubato piano opening for this ballad. And it reminds me of a bunch of standards with an AABA 32 measure melody. Zapatella has little lines of phrases that recall Miles Davis's type of style. Moroni's backing lines pick up nicely on his solo ideas. And Tavalazzi has a more animated bass solo here with ringing high register notes before Zipatella takes the last melody section to a pretty ending. Track 8 is Train, a Coltrane-inspired 12-bar blues. They take it around the form once before Zipatella takes the repeated riff melody for two rounds and Moroni gets up for a solo. He lets loose on this one, so let's check out a little bit of that solo on here.
That gets the weekly triple espresso rating for the uh, solo <laughs> performance there. And the recording ends up with an alternate take of Bird, the track that we heard uh, for number two before. But here, you're going to get to hear the original melody over the confirmation changes right from the start. So we'll end up with just a little sample so you can hear what that sounds like. tasty guitar solo there. And that wraps up the recording. As usual, with Italian jazz, we get high spirits, top class playing, and a lot of fun. Zipatella gives nods to some of the jazz giants, making new compositions built on the elements and signatures of their tunes and styles. All the while, we get a strong sense of his individual personality, big tone, and fluid style. Moroni impresses with both accompaniment and energized solos, and Tavolazzi and Svera are tight and enthusiastic. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, and I also thought a lot of thought and listening went into capturing the styles of the jazz greats named yeah. in the titles of the album. All these tracks are very different from each other. We hear a ballad in Miles, some virtuosic piano playing on train, and some complex rhythm patterns in the drums there too. And odd harmonic excursions within the continuing bop line and bird. All in all, the playing is stellar throughout, and I enjoyed how the band painted the musical profiles of the greats that inspired them. Uh, the recording has all band members on the same dynamic level. It works well in this context, and fans of the greats of the past will probably enjoy this, and I certainly did. Yeah. You always get this positive energy in Italian jazz, and it always too. just makes you feel good, yeah. Yeah, they've got that quality, yeah. All right, the second recording, we're going to get a debut recording here. It's on the Fresh Sound New Talent label, saxophonist Andrew Pereira. Hmm. Lost in Plain Sight came out December 8th, so it's a fresh one here. So saxophonist and composer Andrew Pereira now resides in Brooklyn. He started learning sax from his father at the age of nine, and he studied music at Rutgers University. Then he transferred to Temple University in Philadelphia. After his studies there, he was active on the Philly music scene, playing with names like Peter Erskine, Ignacio Berroa, he was also awarded second place in the North American Saxophone Alliance 2016 Jazz Competition. He came to New York City in 2018, receiving a master's degree in jazz studies from the City College of New York. And he's performing all original sets of music in his performances these days, like we're going to hear on this recording, his debut, Lost in Plain Sight. So we've got Andrew Pereira on alto sax and all compositions here. Netta Ranan on tenor sax. She's a graduate of Berkeley College of Music. Paul Janoshka on piano. Simone Wilson on bass. I believe he's a native of Chile. Jonas Esser on drums. This was recorded at the Samurai Hotel Studios in Queens in November of 2022. We'll start right out with the title track, Lost in Plain Sight. It's a fresh, airy tune. To get things going, it begins with a pickup line of rising piano chords into an eight-measure intro with light dancing cymbals. We hear that rising figure more through the unfolding melody. First, a 24-measure section started by Pereira, joined by Rana with weaving lines of harmony. So let's hear some of this recording get going. Thank you. 
Next there's a 16 measure section that starts with chiming piano chords into syncopated bass and left hand piano figures that the saxes return over, building up tension into the start of Pereira's solo. He blows fluttering, nicely accented phrases, and then Wilson's bass is really mixing up rhythmic ideas underneath. It's a long solo, but he stays really creative, working to a nice climax. So let's get a sense of his sax solo style on this opening tune. joins in there with some backing to take the baton for the next solo. She gets a few angsty low notes on the way, less fluttery and more driving swing phrasing in her solo. Back to the rising piano chimes into the melody once more with different rhythmic sax lines after the piano break section to the end. Track two is alpaca. I guess that's that llama looking thing. <laughs> it's yeah. a little smaller. Yeah, they're kind of cute. They're in South America, right? Right. This has an intro of even ringing piano chords. It's a two measure cycle that repeats twice, getting some snappy bass lines underneath. The melody has kind of a hopeful expression with the two saxes dancing in harmony for 16 measures. There's a four measure transition section with the piano chords and some sax hits together for a break into a solo from Pereira. He's flowing freely over drums and bass, and Yunushka joins back in to get a piano solo, and Wilson has the bass walking underneath. Let's hear some of that action going on a little bit into the tune. From there, they vamp around the chord cycle with some drum filling from Esser. The saxes are back with the original melody that ends suddenly on the first note of the final measure. Track three already there. This tune has an interesting syncopated beat that creates an interesting feel of hesitancy. There's a six measure rhythm section intro and then a couple alternating sections of 12 measures of harmonized sax melody and piano improvisation. The saxes come back with two continuous sections during which a more walking swing feel emerges. Ranon gets a tenor sax solo first on this tune where the feel returns to the original idea and then changes up again. Let's hear some of her soloing style on this tune. Thank you. 
That's some pretty chilled out playing there. Well, Pereira is next, taking an excursion into some harmonic extensions. He ties it rhythmically back to a sax melody line for Ranan to join, and Yunushka gets some ringing piano going, and Esser makes it more pressurized for some sax riffs that move it to the finish. Track 4, Falcon on the Balcony, a dreamy alternating chord bass ostinato for an 8 measure intro. The meter feels like a slow 3-4, but when the saxes come in with the melody, the feel switches to 4 beats. The ostinato will return though before the next section. Let's hear this unique feel get going. pretty dreamy stuff there. Hmm, Wilson too. gets a ringing melodic bass solo first here and uh, let's hear some of that in this tune as well. Pereira gets a lifting alto sax solo on this one as well before Ron on his back to join him on the sax melody lines and some soft lines over the ostinato to an unresolved ending. Track 5, Out of Focus. A different feel for this one with an even clicky beat and repeated even bass notes on the beat creating a steady 3-4 kind of feel. The harmonized sax melody is long and slowly evolving over unexpected phrase lengths with some rising and falling bass and left hand piano lines underneath. Pereira has a solo mixing rhythmic intensity with more flighty lines. Ronan blows more legato and connected lines on this one with a warm tone. And Yunushka has a smoothly ringing piano spot too. But the saxes return to weave more improvisations together on top before getting back to the melody together. Track 6 is Curbside Dash. Pereira has the pickup phrase into this tune, soon joined by Ronan with weaving lines over syncopated bass and piano figures that keep it pushing forward with a six beat feel. After a little interlude, the sax lines get an undulating kind of thing going together. So let's hear this one get started. <laughs> Thank you. 
piano drops out for the saxes to exchange solo phrases in conversation here, the incessant rhythmic push dissipates, leaving Yanushka in free time over ringing bass for a solo. Esser brings the drive back, joining the bass with cymbals. The sax melody lines are back with a softening effect for some final riffs and ringing bass at the ending. And the final track, Seven Moon Burn. A unique pulsing bass ostinato figure sets the mood for this one on an eight measure introduction with a light Latin feel. The harmonized sax melody starts softly but develops more accented motion over three 16 measure sections. Pinot is up first for a solo, so let's hear from him one more time in this tune. Well, he goes on and on from there, and Ronan follows with a tenor solo, and Inoshka gets a piano solo as well that gets backing sax lines into more animated sections of the original sax melody to the end. All original compositions that have a fresh quality and airiness to them, there's a lot of variety in the rhythmic feels and meters, with development over longer sections rather than repeated standard phrase lengths. I'd need more listening sessions to get the structures and shapes into my mind. I like the dual sax format, and Pereira has arranged the harmonies and weaving lines well. His alto tone is pleasing, with lots of technical facility and harmonic exploration on his solos. Ronan's tenor tone is a good complement with her own sense of phrasing, and the rhythm section works well together to capture the unique feel with particularly interesting bass lines and grooves from Wilson. Let's see what direction Pereira goes from here with his original music. Yeah, so I guess you could say the uh, structures of these work are kind of like the the jazz version of the Ranitsky this week, because we yeah. don't know how yeah. this goes either. This was a pretty classy record, I thought. Um hmm. As yeah, I think we heard a lot of that in the samples, right? Uh, with some interesting ideas in the structure, as you said, in the solos as well as the compositions. There are some really nice touches too. I really like the way the theme melted back in after the solos and already there. It just kind of yeah magically reappeared. After which the piano plays a tremolo pattern as accompaniment. It was really beautiful. I feel like these compositions use classical music ideas without ever sounding classical. So it's sort of like hmm. the structure right. is kind of put together that way, but. Otherwise, it's all jazz. And there's no classical technique in the playing either. Although these guys may very well be classically trained, but it really just sound like jazz. But I just kind of got that sense because the uh, compositions are pretty sophisticated. And I'm thinking of the rising keys and the theme of curbside dash, for example. That kind of sounds sort of like a classical right. approach to harmony. I found the structure of the compositions to be interesting and a bit unusual with soloists occasionally coming in during a main solo to comment on it like an out of focus when mm. the saxes take over from the piano. It's a sophisticated record and appealing with ample ideas in the solos and interesting compositions. I think I said that several times, but uh, I mean it. That's what really drew my attention. It's really satisfying on a lot of levels. And like you said, it's going to require a bit of repeated listening to really figure out what's going on. Yeah. Well, great mm. debut, Andrew. Good stuff. Yeah. can only uh, imagine you're what you're going to come act. up with next. Very good. <laughs> All right, the recording I've really been waiting for. When I found this recording, I was intrigued by the concept, but every listen has just made it more interesting to me. At yeah. first, I was really hoping that it had come out a couple weeks earlier, so we could have paired it with last week's Bertrand Chamoyou recording of Sati. But now I kind of like having it offset by a week because... Yeah, I did too. I got to think about things a little bit more. I'm uh, speaking of... Recording by Caspar Van Miel, Sati, A Time Remembered. This is on O-Tone Records, came out December 8th. Dutch bassist 
Van Miel's second album as a leader, and he says, quote, even though many jazz musicians were influenced by impressionist composers like Sati, the scales that Sati applied are still not commonly used, unquote. Interesting to think about. Van Miel's arrangements are influenced by old-time jazz greats like Duke Ellington, Mingus, Gil Evans, and also more contemporary composers like Dave Holland, Abishai Cohen. And the title of this project, Time Remembered, comes from the famous composition by Bill Evans, also influenced by Impressionist Harmony. It's an example of the way that Impressionist composers like Sati influenced jazz musicians. So Van Miel here has put together his version of this piece of Evans's music with Satie's. He says when Satie wrote his famous works for piano, Europe was going through a tumultuous period. The feeling of vast political, technological, and social change must have been quite similar to the mood of the age we are currently living in. It's from the album notes. The Nocians seem to reflect this zeitgeist. They breathe a heavy, melancholic vibe as if mourning the loss of a time to be remembered and his quote, There are striking similarities between our age and the time in which Sati wrote these works, which to me makes this music as relevant as ever. Hmm. I think that's something John Picard would say too. Yeah, yeah. something interesting there. Yeah. And I think this recording is really interesting. So on this recording, we've got Ryan Carneo on trumpet, Dennis Gabel on tenor saxophone, Raphael Clem on trombone, Franz von Chossi piano, Kasper von Miel, the leader here on bass, and Nicholas Walter on drums. All the music we're going to hear here is originally composed by Satie with one Bill Evans composition, and von Miel has arranged everything here. Now there's so many interesting things to talk about in this recording because the arrangements are constantly evolving. You'll need to listen to this repeatedly to really appreciate it. I'll try to summarize mm. and give some high points, and I'm going to be sampling a lot here because mm. there's really a lot to taste on this recording. Track one, Nocian number one, a rhythmic trombone riff starts it out and gets joined by drums, piano, and the other horns. You won't know what you're listening to yet, and then a little groove gets going with piano improvisation to a break where you'll get the famous melody. So let's check it out from there at about 45 seconds into the tune. Probably you recognize that melody, but can you tell me what's different? Go back and listen again with the rhythm. You see, now I've read that the original piano solo versions of the first three Nocian were written without time signatures or bar lines. Right. However, I've seen it notated in 4-4, four, four, and that's hmm. what it usually sounds like on the piano recordings. But here, Von Miel has got it in a very cool syncopated 5-4 meter. Hmm. Kind of like a one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two. So that's pretty unique, the way he serves that up there. From that point on, there's a gutsy tenor sax solo from Gabel and an interesting rhythmic piano solo from Van Chossi that gets horn backing lines. And things quiet down for a rhythmic bass solo from Van Miel over lightly dancing piano. So let's check out his bass solo in this tune.
After that, the horns get a solely section of weaving rhythmic lines over the drums until everyone is back in to build it up through a transition section back to another run through the melody. And don't miss the change to 4-4 over walking bass right at the end. You're going to find something new every time you listen to this recording. Track 2, Nocian number 4. This one we noted as unique last week when we heard Shamayu's version. That's track 15 if you want to go back and check it out. Instead of the usual broken chord rhythmic left hand we hear in Sati, there's a rising and falling 12 note bass line in that. The bass going between C minor and D minor. We get a solo piano start here from Von Chosi that's quite different, but explores the harmonies in his own way. So let's check out the beginning of this. Well, the three-beat bass ostinato brings in the horns on an arrangement of lines that take on a lot of triplet figures. Things thin out to an exciting trumpet solo from Carnio over Great Groove. And Von Chossi gets a piano solo next that's rhythmically and harmonically very explorative. So let's check out some of the piano solo here. Well, the horn lines float back with more triplet figures and the section works into a new groove for the ending that has a Latin-y six-beat feel before returning to horn triplets. Track three is Time Remembered, Bill Evans' tune. It was recorded for the first time in 1962 for the album Loose Blues, which was released in 1982 and released for the first time in 1966 in Bill Evans' trio with Symphony Orchestra. But it shows up on a lot of other recordings including the live album Time Remembered. Harmonically, it's really interesting. It's built over four modes, Dorian, Phrygian, Lydian, and Aeolian. And it's interesting because it kind of lacks dominant seventh chords. It only uses major and minor chords and extensions. So there's like ninths, elevenths, and thirteenths in there. So it sounds modal and kind of impressionistic. Of course, on Everybody Digs Bill Evans' famous recording, 1958, there's Peace, Peace, and some other time that has a kind of Satie and Debussy influence it was clear in his playing. Here this gets a slow processional treatment at the start over weighty bass and piano figures. Gabel's sax takes the lead into a nice blend of trumpet and trombone. Let's hear how they present this.
Francesi's up first for a ringing piano solo, and Clem follows with a trombone solo with nice phrasing, and then Van Miel has a bass solo, sprinkling in some cool harmonics on the way. Carniel gets the solo melody line restarted on trumpet and gets joined by the other horns. It ends up returning to the plotting opening feel with the return of Gabel's sax in the lead, and he gets to extend it to some final chords with the horns. Track four, Nocien number two, this gets kind of a heavy rock groove, which is cool. There's an eight measure intro, and then the melody is for the arranged horns and easy to recognize. So let's hear this one getting going. Well, the trumpet gets the lead in the next section of the arrangement, and Van Miel's rhythmic bass pulse is propelling everything. Clem has a trombone solo with tricky slide work and some neat interval ideas, and his playing is really interesting on this whole recording, so let's check out a little bit of the trombone here. Gabel is next with a slinky tenor sax solo connecting into the other horns, returning with the melody arrangement. The horns get some collective improvisation along the way before the final phrase. Track 5, Gimenopide number 1. Everyone knows this one. They were all in 3-4 time, and you'll catch the harmony right away. And Van Miel gets to start this one out with a lovely bass solo with soft horn backing lines. We've got to hear this too because it's just really nice. Interesting way to experience that familiar melody. Carneo's Harmon muted trumpet adds a new texture as it goes along. The horns pick up the original melody from about a minute and 40 seconds with little piano interludes. Great arranging here. Clem has a dreamy and longing trombone solo, and Von Chossi has a unique solo here with little hesitations and phrase turns, exploring some interesting scales, and he's left to float on his own to the conclusion of a rubato line into a restart of the horn melody. I found that really magical. Carneo's muted trumpet leads the horns into a slowed final phrase of colorful harmonies. Track six, Nocian number three, the intro, 
And this piece is number six on Shameo's recording we heard last week. And this one always has a kind of sadness to it to me. Van Meel gives a solo bass intro here with cool double stop strings, melodic phrases, and intervals. Let's check this out a little bit. That goes on for about a minute and a half, and Van Meel continues on setting a solo bass groove for the rest of the rhythm section to join in on. Interestingly, he's made this main tune, the next track, sassy rather than sad well, with the horn arrangement. So I got a different perspective of this. Uh, there's some muted trumpet with some growls in there. So I'd like to hear uh, the difference of how this sounds once it gets going into the tune a little bit. I like how the feel changes up there with some tasty snare drum underneath. The horns build up some ominous tension over a repeating 12-note trombone figure into an unmuted trumpet solo, or maybe it's flugelhorn from Carnium. Gabel gets the solo baton pass there and works speedy lines rising out of the lower register on the sax, and the sassy horn arrangement returns with some more wah-wah in the brass this time. The ominous trombone line is back and the horns get to improv and growl a bit as the drums fill and crank up the push to the end. And the recording is going to end with premier ogive. The ogives are four pieces for piano composed in the late 1880s by Satie. He was inspired by the form of the windows of Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. So that's the ogive, the curve that forms the outline of the pointed Gothic arch. So these have like paired phrases, somewhat like plain chant hmm. music. And Satie wanted to evoke the feeling of a large pipe organ reverberating in a cathedral. Here, the melody phrase is introduced by Clem's solo trombone into a slow restatement by a full horn arrangement with cymbals and tom fills. On this one, Carneo comes out of that with a solo. It sounds like flugelhorn here. It's really warm and fluffy, so I thought we'd just sample a bit of his playing because I skipped over his earlier solo.
It pauses for another somber horn arrangement exposition of the theme. Gabel has the next solo on tenor sax with a sense of urgent searching. The horns and drums layer a bit of cacophony into a final statement of the theme to wrap it up. Last episode, Bertrand Chamoyou made us experience Satie's music in a new way through his unique programming and in combination with the Satie-inspired music of John Cage. Van Miel has done the same from a jazz perspective, exploring the unique harmonies of Satie's music and imagining new rhythmic possibilities for the melodies. Excellent arranging, getting the most of the colors and harmonies from the three horns. His own bass solos are intriguing. Von Chossi's piano ideas are great, and the horns are all inspired and creative in their solo spots. If you enjoy Satie's music and jazz arranging, you definitely don't want to miss this recording. I'm amazed that there can be so much extracted and expanded on from the short and minimalist works of Satie that make you both think and feel new ideas. I've had Satie on the brain for the past two weeks, and I'm sure that's a good thing. Yeah, it's kind of, uh, it's it does kind of change your brain a little bit. All those like wonderful modal harmonies. I really love it. You know, when things like this happen, when you get like yeah. a, a new piano recording of Satie, they're very rare because, you know, people don't, you know, they're not really virtuosic works or anything like yeah. that. So we got this one with John Cage on it. And now we have a jazz one that's going to come out more or less at the same time. And we yeah. get to talk about it here. Yeah, I liked this too. It, it's it's a really different take on these uh, works than we get in the piano version. They're kind of mysterious and floaty. Mm. And once you add a jazz rhythm to those uh, themes, it, that mystery disappears, but something else appears. It's kind of, you still have those fantastic modes. Yeah, I think that's the appeal for the musicians to say, I, I need to focus on this in my improvisations. Right. and. Yeah, and it's pretty interesting because they're not ordinary modes either. They seem mm. really unique to Satie. I mean, Satie's music to this day sounds really unique. Mm. And it's probably because people haven't really used those modes. These are great chords to solo over, and we get some inventive solos on this album too. I kind of like the characterizations too. Like the third Nyosien has like a kind of sexy sway to it by the brass. It's right. kind of, you know, there's something kind of, you know, sexy about it with that that's not in the original piano piece. When you hear it, right? In time remembered, had a bluesy feel to it to me um, in this on this album. Mm. And while these are far removed from the feel of the original piano works, the themes are all easily identifiable. And these takes really show what else is in there, and there's probably yeah. more to be discovered besides. This is a really interesting listen with some really inventive takes on this music. It's interesting, yeah. You can extract and expand upon a minimalist idea, you know, and mm. do something with it. I've thought that on this recording, Van Miel did a lot with the arrangements and got really creative with the rhythmic possibilities that were in here and using all the horns, different colors and combinations. You know, I, every time I listen to this, I find something new. So it's really going to be on my you know favorite list, I think. That'd be good listening for the uh, between Christmas and New Year's, let's yeah, say. He has absolutely. the New Year's coming up. Time remembered. Time remembered. Yeah, let's yeah. remember some time there. All right, that's it. That's all of our new recordings for this year. I don't know. There's a few hundred of them there, <laughs> 300 yeah. and some. And a few hundred to come next year. <laughs> yeah. Our task for the next week is to sift through all the things we've talked about this year and pick our best. And next week... Well, our favorites, let's say. We're, yeah, it's really a very favorites. subjective uh, it's list. It's just I subjective, think. yeah. Yeah. I guess the way I look at it is the things that I kept going back to listen to Right, me again too. and again. So, or the things that intrigued me too, like right. you know, maybe I didn't listen to them as many times, but it stayed in my mind somehow. You know. By the way, if there's anyone out there who thinks they can listen to more music than I do, <laughs> just uh, <laughs> shoot me a message because I have for every running current listening list, I have thirty pages. That's two lines each for each album. Yeah. Thirty pages of that of stuff that we're never going to get to, but I've listened at least in part to all of those. So I can oh. send you a few thousand recordings if you need more listening material. So Well, there it is. Russ listens to more music than I do, and I thought I was like... Uh... <laughs> well, what I mean, you know, hey, there might yeah. be somebody who's uh, shut in somewhere or in the hospital and you really want to listen to stuff, be happy to share because uh, the rest of that stuff is just going to get archived, and I've got hundreds of pages of it. So I just want to say, if you're listening to that much music, do a podcast. Yeah, what do you your doing? own podcast. Right? <laughs> anyway... We'll come back next week. Well, that'll be released on uh, Christmas morning, I think. Yeah. 
in Japan anyway. In so Japan, Christmas it will, Eve, yeah. it'll be Christmas in Eve, yeah. the uh, U.S. and North America. Give Santa something to listen to while he's uh, delivering his presents right. on his sleigh, you know. And then we'll be back with uh, some more new music. We'll be working off from uh, 2023 releases for a little while, I suppose. Late 2023. There is some good stuff that just came out in classical just uh, December 15th. I was really surprised. <laughs> you know, it's pretty late in the year. I've got a handful of new trumpet releases I think I'm going to put together to get out mm. there. And there's some other intriguing stuff as well. So we don't have any shortage of uh, things in the new basket to uh, release. So those right. will be coming your way soon as well. As always, thanks to Fast Signs of Staten Island for our glowing neon logo. Be sure to check out the Same Difference podcast. The link is in the episode description. You'll hear the promo. Don't forget to go over and check out those guys on New Year's Day to hear our guest spot over there. I'm looking forward to hearing that myself. And if you want to know the best of the year releases, just tune in again next week on Christmas Day when you get tired of uh, all the relatives, you know, grandma's driving you crazy and uh, nieces and nephews are running around, well, go into the side room and you can check out uh, about 40 albums in the classical and jazz category to take you away from all of your family woes. Yeah. Actually, why don't you just play our podcast for all of them and it'll just... Uh, <laughs> They'll all be asleep. Tranquilize them instantly. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> anyway, this has been episode 144 of Adult Music and we'll be back with our favorite picks of 2023 next week. Until then, keep listening and we'll see you again next time. Same difference. Two jazz fans, one jazz standard. A review of a single jazz standard through music, history, and stories. And this is AJ. And this is Johnny. If you are a jazz fan and you like jazz standards, bebop, show tunes, ballads, you name it. Yeah, we've got them here. We drop a new show on you every other week, and we take a standard, and we listen to a few different versions of it. Same difference. Come join the fun. Looking forward to seeing you. Thank you.